Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be looking today at verses 1 through 14. And what I'll do is I'll take you to verse 14, but obviously uh, I will want to pick up probably at verse uh, 13 or so next week and give you some more introduction and more information because I'll be closing on ver at verse 14, but I want to build it a little more next week. And we'll, you'll see that. That's how I usually teach. And for those of you who are not normally here, what I like to do is I'll take the first several minutes to lay a foundation so that you have an idea of the direction this book is going to go because every book has a purpose. And so I'll give you some of the direction and information. Then, then we're going to pick up at verse 1 and we'll go through it up to verse 14. So we're doing our introduction today in the book of Colossians. I'll give you background information, try and give you some information as it relates to the scriptures that we're looking at. We'll conclude at verse 14, pick up next week, probably give you some more information, and then move on until we complete the book. So let's begin reading together here in Colossians chapter 1 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 8, and we'll get into our study. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 8. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth as you also learned from Epaphras our dear fellow servant who's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf who also declared to us your love in the spirit and so, as we begin, Paul is speaking concerning the gospel, the message of the gospel. And as we begin, we need to remember the message of the gospel was not intended to be preached only in the nation of Israel. Jesus intended the message of the gospel to go throughout the world. He intended people to receive this message that they might have life. And when he was giving his commission in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Remember at the end of the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus is about to commission them to go out into the world, he said to them, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he said, Go and make disciples of all the nations. So the message of the gospel was intended to go beyond the borders of Israel. Now remember, Jesus was speaking to 11 men who had never traveled beyond their own borders. Now he's commanding them to go into the entire world. And the men would not have completely understood what he was saying. They wouldn't have understood what this really means. They didn't have a complete knowledge of how immense the world actually is because Israel is a small area of land. Today, Israel is roughly equivalent in size to the, the state of New Jersey. It's a small place. You know, it's around 200 miles from the north to the south, around 200 miles, which would be like leaving Chino and driving up to San Luis Obispo. East to west, it's around 70 miles. Again, it's like if you left the city of Chino and you went up to Camarillo. So it's not that big. It's a small nation, but that was their world. And these people were not seasoned travelers, yet they're told, you need to go into the entire world. So how are they going to be successful? How are they going to be able to go into all the world to preach the gospel? Remember, Jesus trained them, and Jesus taught them scripture, and Jesus authorized them for their mission. But all the training and teaching, all the authority was not enough for them to succeed. They still were lacking something. So Jesus made sure that they had that which they were lacking. And what they were lacking was power. 
They needed the power of the Holy Spirit. They needed the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to go into the whole world to preach this message of the gospel. And so Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So you have the commission, you have the information, but you need the power. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that the gospel would spread and have impact. And so this message of the gospel spread out. Many took the gospel into the known world. And one of those people who received that gospel and shared that gospel is mentioned in verses 7 and 8. His name is Epaphras. He planted the church there in central Turkey in a place called Colossae. And Paul had said that they learned the word of truth from this faithful minister of Jesus Christ. So Paul didn't plant this church, but was writing instructions to the church. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, it makes it very clear there that Paul was unknown by face to many of them. He didn't plant the church, but as an apostle, he was concerned for them. Remember, he had told Timi Timothy in, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 11, that he was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. He had a concern for these people. He was a preacher, a teacher. He was an evangelist, missionary. And he was a man who had concern for believers. His love for the Lord overflowed. It resulted in a love for those whom Jesus loved. And he learned that. He learned how people loved, lo uh, Jesus loved people when he encountered Christ on the road to Damascus. Because remember how Paul was breathing out threatenings for all of those who were followers of Christ. And he was accosted, if you will. His journey was interrupted by Jesus. And uh, he fell to, to the ground and, and he went temporarily blind and he heard a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And remember how he said, who, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, when you persecute one of mine, you're persecuting me. So he learned from Christ, of Christ's love for people. And he learned that the church was dear to Jesus, and the church became dear to him. So as an apostle, he carried a concern for churches in general. He had a concern for the things that mattered. And it was a concern for these things that was greater than anything he had. And no matter what he had gone through, he still had a greater concern for Christians, for believers. When you read 2 Corinthians, on a couple of occasions, he begins to speak a bit about the things he's gone through, the shipwrecks and the beatings and the scourgings, how he's been a night and a day in, in the depth of the sea, and so many things that he'd gone through. And yet, when he's speaking concerning what really mattered and what he really thought about and all of that, he says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28, he said, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, and went on to say, my deep concern for all the churches. So Paul had a concern for the church, and he wanted to make sure that this church was protected, the church of Colossae. Now, again, Epaphras is one of the many faithful but not famous believers in the Bible. There are many people mentioned in Scripture with great testimonies that we never hear. We, we hear of Epaphras here in verses 7 and 8. He's a fellow servant. He's a faithful minister. And he gives witness to their faithfulness and love in the Spirit to Paul. But that's pretty much what you hear about him. So that ought to help us as ordinary people in the day that we live in. Instead of trying to seek for great things for ourselves, even as we're told by Jeremiah, seek them not. There are some today who seem to have forgotten that we need to remember that much of our story will never be heard by anybody else. The world isn't going to hear about us necessarily. And that's okay, because we need to be faithful in what we're called to do. You see, there are many, many who are used in wonderful ways that are known only to God and very few others. And that's all right, because most people remain unknown, and most people never become famous. It's like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, when he spoke and used the phrase as unknown and yet well-known. Paul was speaking of himself. He says, I'm unknown to some, but well-known to those that matter. And in your life, that's the way it is too. One of the things that we need to understand is it doesn't really matter who knows our name as long as he does. If God knows your name, that's all that really matters. 
And, and that really should be what we're concerned about, not being known by man, but being recognized by God so that the Lord may say, come on in. I prepared this from the foundation of the world for you. So come on in. I know your name, even though others may not. Paul said that I'm unknown, but I'm well known. I'm unknown to some, but well known to those who matter. But I'm especially well known to God. You see, it's, it's from Jesus that we receive the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ who sees, and it's Jesus who rewards. In Hebrews 6, verse 10, it says, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. God knows what you're doing for him, and he'll reward you accordingly. Now, Paul spent time in prison for preaching the message of the gospel, but he used the time wisely. While imprisoned in Rome, he wrote Ephesians, he wrote Philemon, he wrote Philippians, and he wrote the book of Colossians. And Colossians was written somewhere around the years 60 to 62 AD. As is true with all of his letters, Paul had a purpose in writing this epistle. He wrote to warn the church against error in doctrine. An error that's entering in to the church. And we'll see that as we go through this book. We'll see that error, and we'll be looking at it. It's, he speaks of it. But this particular error that was beginning to seep into the church and affecting them was a system that combined Greek philosophy with Jewish legalism and a touch of mysticism. And they were watering down the Christian truth. And what they were doing, these false teachers, what they were doing was they were reducing Jesus Christ from Messiah, God in the flesh. They were reducing him to a Jewish philosopher. And Paul is, is, is correcting this because this error will seep into the pews, if you will, if it's not confronted and dealt with. And believe it or not, because the world that we live in today is, quote-unquote, so tolerant of so much, believe it or not, Paul would immediately respond to error because error infects the way that you live because the way you believe is how you behave. And when you begin to believe wrong things about Christ, your life is going to be stifled in terms of its fruit. So naturally, when he hears of this error that begins to seep into the church there in Colossae, naturally, he addresses it because your behavior is always built on your beliefs. And so what he's going to do here is he's going to reveal that. He intends to reveal the preeminence of Jesus Christ because as you go through this book, he's going to point out some things about our relationship with him. He reveals that we're rooted in him. He reveals that we're alive in him. He reveals that we're hidden in him and complete in him. Now, when you look at Colossians, it's actually divided. It's got four chapters. It's divided into two sections, chapters 1 and 2, and then chapters 3 and 4. Chapter 1 and 2 deals with doctrine, and chapters 3 and 4 give us practical application. Again, our belief and our behavior. And so this is what we'll be looking at as we go through together the book of Colossians. So we'll begin at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 and 2, and we'll get into our study. That was your introduction. Let's get into our study. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how he begins, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul was chosen to be an apostle while on the road to Damascus. While he was breathing out threatenings concerning followers of Christ, Christ actually arrested him. And so he speaks concerning one who's been chosen by the will of God. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, the Lord was speaking to a man by the name of Ananias. Ananias was hesitant to go and pray for Paul because God had just said, go and pray for him. Ananias, Ananias thought it would be wise to kind of like fill God in on some recent events. And he said to him, this is a guy who's been damaging the church and you want me to go and you want me to pray for him. Um, and God speaks to him and says, go. He says, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and, be and before the people of Israel. And so he was chosen. He says that I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, he said it like this. He said, Paul, an apostle, 
not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. I was not appointed an apostle by men. I didn't go to apostle classes. I was chosen by God. It's like what Jesus said in John 15, 16, when he spoke of his own disciples, his apostles, and he said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So he says, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Then he makes reference in verse 1 to Timothy, Timothy our brother. Again, we know Timothy who was converted to Christ under the ministry of Paul. We see in Acts chapter 16 verses 1 and 3 about him. We know that Paul wrote him two letters, First and Second Timothy. We know that his mother was Jewish, his father was a Greek. And this is a man who got saved and was traveling with Paul. Now, so it's Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, as well as Timothy, our brother. Verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who were in Colossae. When he says to the saints, the saints is the word hagias. It speaks of being separated. God is the one who separates you to be called a saint. We in our day will say, well, what do you think you are, some kind of saint? And, and all of that. But the fact is, we are. We are. You can call me Saint David. I do have a ring. No, we, 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 we. The word saint means the one who's been set apart. That's God's work. God set you apart. So when you see the saints and the faithful first, you see God's work. You are a saint. You have been set apart. It's been said that either you're a saint or an ain't. You're one of the two. If you're saved, you are a set-apart one who is being used by the Lord. Again, that is God's work. He sets you apart. A saint in the New Testament is one who trusts in God's promises. It is one who is convinced that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that Jesus is Messiah and that he is the author of salvation. Now, the word faithful speaks of man's side of salvation. You see, the faithful are those who have trusted Jesus for salvation. So he did his work, and we do ours as we serve him. Now, as a combination, God sets us apart, but we, by faith, are faithful to him as we serve. It's like what Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into ministry. So God is the one who counts you faithful, and God is the one who puts you in ministry, but you're faithful in your service to him. And so there's your introduction. And he says, grace to you and peace. I want you to notice the word grace and peace and the sequence. The word grace always goes before peace. When you read your Bible, you'll see in the letters, grace and peace. You never see peace and grace. He says grace and peace. Why? Because without grace, you'll never have peace. So you always step into grace, and then you experience peace. And those are actually a combination of the common greetings during the day. So the word grace is the Greek word charis. So if I were Greek and I'm walking on the street and I'm there in Athens and I see one of my friends, he would turn and say charis. And that's simply a greeting. If I'm in Israel, and we heard this plenty just recently, they will say shalom because shalom is peace. It's a common greeting. What he did is he took the common greetings of his day, grace and peace, Gentile and Jew, combined them, put them in proper order, grace first, then peace, and that's common salutation. So grace to you and peace. Where does it come from? God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he says, verse 3, we give thanks, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and, and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. And so we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. He gives thanks because they've been saved. And the church has a good testimony. 
Notice how Paul heard of their faith. He had heard of their love and their hope. Their faith, love, and hope that motivated their lives. Their reputation preceded them because Epaphras had given Paul a good report. All churches have reputations. All churches have reputations. When you read your Bible, you'll see that Paul makes mention of that to the book of Rome, in the book of Romans to the Roman church. In the first chapter, he speaks concerning their faith that has been communicated throughout the world. So the Roman church was known for its evangelism. And so you'll see that there is a testimony that a church has. You're known for something. He speaks to the Thessalonians in chapter 1 again. And he speaks concerning the fact that they're enduring suffering. And so they were known for being faithful in the face of suffering and persecution. They had a reputation. Paul makes mention of it. And then he speaks to the Corinthians. And the Corinthians also had a reputation. What was the reputation? Carnality. I mean, it's interesting. There are 16 chapters in 1 Corinthians. And so for the first eight verses or so, Paul commends them. You fall short in no gift. And he's sharing with them. And then in chapter 1, then from verse 8 into verse 9, from verse 9 until chapter 16, the conclusion, he rebukes and exhorts them. Why? Because they had so many sins going on that he had to deal with them one by one. So every church has a reputation in the, Old Te in the New Testament as well as today. Every church has a reputation. And for me, I want to guard the reputation of our ministry. I want people to know that we're a people who love the Lord. I would love people, if they hear Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, I would like them to be able to say, that's a good church, great people. Remember that the church is you. It's made up by you. And the things that you live out in the world is what this church is known for. So may I encourage you to live for Jesus Christ. To live for Jesus Christ. Because you're not only reflecting on the kingdom of God, which is the most important thing, of course, you also are reflecting on your family. And this is your church family if this is your home. And so my mom used to tell me that about my poor reputation and how it affected my father's name. Well, every church has a reputation, and the Colossians have one too. And Paul said, I heard of your faith, and I've heard of your love. That's a great reputation. Wouldn't it be great? If people would say, Chino Valley, that's a place filled with faith and love. That's a church filled with grace and hope because that's what we get from Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that today. So we need to have that kind of attitude. He says it in verse 4. We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. We heard. We heard of your faith. We heard of your love. They had heard before the word of truth, he said in verse 5. From the day that they heard, they had borne fruit, he said in verse 6. He, from the day that he heard of it, had not ceased to pray for them. So he's hearing things, and they've heard things, and their reputations preceded them. And Paul rejoices to hear how they live for Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus and love for other people, that reveals that you're actually saved. That's how people know you're a Christian. By this shall they know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one for another. This is how they know, because you walk in the truth, even as John said, that he rejoices when he hears that his children are walking in truth. And so your way of life makes such a tremendous impact. You're to preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, you use words, because you are an open book. You are a letter, Paul said to the Corinthians, known and read by all men. And so even a child is known by his deeds, whether he's good or evil, by the things that they do. You can tell. And so he's saying, you have a reputation of faith. You have a reputation of love. They also were known as those who had hope. You see, you'll not have a biblical faith or a genuine love without accurate Bible teaching. That's why Paul is concerned. That's why he's concerned about them because they need to receive the whole counsel of God so that their lives line up with God's word. And so today, unfortunately, we have some who say, well, I, I follow Christ but never read his word. So in reality, what we're doing is following our own inclinations of our heart. Because sometimes what happens is we'll read something that we don't agree with. So rather than saying, God, you're saying something that I'm having trouble with, we just say, well, I'll ignore that and do what I feel most comfortable with. 
A lot of people are doing that, unfortunately, today. But Paul would be saying that's going to be a road that is going to destroy your walk. These false teachers are walking in. And as they're coming in, they're bringing false things about Christ. And when they bring these false things, you're going to stumble. So I rejoice to know that you actually love the Lord, that you have faith. And I actually am blessed to know that you actually love one another. Because, you know, he who says that he loves God, well, he's not going to hate his brother. Because how can a man love God whom he's not seen and hate his brother whom he does see? And so we need to understand that if we really say, I'm a Christian, that the mark of the believer, and like Jesus said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples, is to love one another. And so he's blessed over that. In 1 John 3, 23, John said this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So, if you're asking God to increase your faith, it comes to spending time in his word. And if you desire love, it's also defined for you and refined through the message of Christ. It is revealed in the giving of Christ, but it is informed through scripture. We're living in a time when we unfortunately as a society have equated tolerance with love. And that's, been a, that's, a, that's a bad mistake. The more tolerant we are, we think the more loving we are. There are times we have to define what love actually is. And we ought to. And the Bible does give us a good insight into what that is. In 1 Corinthians, for example, chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, Paul tells us love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. Love is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. I remember this guy who was saying that we gets, he gets in fights with his wife. She gets, his, she gets all historical. And his friend says, you mean hysterical? And he said, no, historical. She brings up everything I've ever done. <laughs> but it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes, always perseveres. Then he said, and love never fails. So if we took time just to understand what these qualities of love are, we could apply those to our daily lives. You see, false teachers are undermining this foundation. That's why Paul's addressing it. Teaching God's word accurately provides a foundation of faith, love, and hope. And because the church has faith, love, and hope, Paul is inspired, and he begins to pray for them. Notice in verse 5 how he says, Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. The word hope, we use the word hope as if, well, I hope it doesn't rain. You know, I... I, I hope I graduate. Uh, I, hope, I hope the Dodgers don't blow it this year. You know, we, we hope. But we, we use the word hope as if it's something we're not confident. The Bible doesn't. The word hope speaks of a confident expectation. Paul in the book of Romans says we are saved by hope. There's a confident expectation. God has said it. I believe it. That settles it. That's hope. We know. We're confident. No matter what goes, we go through in our life, no matter what ups and downs, no matter what waves that we deal with, no matter what struggles we experience, no matter what pain we endure, we have a hope, a sure anchor. And it holds us fast in the midst of the trials and the struggles that we go through. Hope is a confident expectation. It has an, an element of future fulfillment in heaven. So we hold fast because we're just passing through. We're going to make it. God is with us. There's no way we won't. He who began a good work will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. He doesn't leave me, nor does he forsake me. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. I don't walk by myself. If I were walking in the valley of the shadow of death by myself, naturally, I wouldn't have any confidence. But he's with me. He's by my side. He takes care of me. And he carries me in the times that I'm struggling. That's the God that I serve. And so we have hope, a confidence. Jesus said it. That settles it. And that's what he's speaking to. And he's pointing that out 
to the Colossians. You see, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And because he conquered the grave in him, we are victorious. The grave has no victory over us. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? It isn't there. Why? Because Jesus took it on our behalf. So we have a hope of heaven. So we'll be with Jesus Christ in heaven. Our names are engraved in the Lamb's Book of Life. And one day we'll hear him say, come on up here. And one of these days, he'll look us in the eye and he will say, welcome in to the joy of thy Lord. I prepared this from the foundation of the earth and it belongs to you. And that's what Christians hold fast to. So Paul is saying that you have confidence. You have hope. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. He has given us an inheritance and it's inspiring. And we will have fellowship with Jesus for eternity. Hope will never perish unlike things of this age. Hope does not rot nor decay. Hope is permanent. It doesn't spoil. It doesn't fade. Hope is pure. It's spotless. It doesn't wither. And this hope is kept. That word kept means to be reserved, guarded, protected, or put aside. It is kept just for us by God himself. And he says in verse 5, the second portion, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. We have hope because we can trust the message of the gospel because it's true. You can trust the gospel. It's the word of truth. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus was praying to his father. He said, sanctify them in your truth. And then he went on to say, your word is truth. In Ephesians 1.13, Paul said, you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. It is the word of truth. And in embracing that word of truth, we have life. I was in an airport a number of years ago now. I was returning from a trip. And somebody came walking, and I was watching them as they were walking, and they were talking to people who were seated waiting for their flights. And watching this person move back and forth, they knew they would eventually come and speak to me, which they did. And they said, he said, hello, I am selling a book. If you'd like it, I'd like to sell it to you for a donation. And I said, oh, really? And what is this book? He said, it is a book that contain, contains words of life. I said, really? He said, yes, it's the Bhagavad Gita. He was a Hindu. It's the Bhagavad. I said, really? He said, yes, this book contains words of life. And I have... You know, my pocket Bible, I've told you before, I carry this, my Bible, it's the sword. But I have the pocket Bible I call my switchblade. And so I had my switchblade. And I pulled my switchblade out. And I said, this is the word of eternal life. This word here tells me of my God. And the guy says to me, oh, God cannot be seen. He is beyond fathoming. And I said, indeed, that is why he took upon himself human flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. I said, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and the word is Jesus Christ, for in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. I said, so yeah, we have the truth right here. I don't need to pay for a Bhagavad Gita. I've got the word of truth in my pocket and in my heart. And he walked away, but that was true. <laughs> But it was true. And see, so we need to understand that today. It is the word of truth. It isn't man's ideas. It is God's declaration. And we're saved by holding fast. We're saved by holding to it. And he says, you heard the word of truth. It wasn't some man's opinion. It was God's declaration. And that's the point he's making for us as we look at that. Now, I have some water because my voice is saying, shut up. But I say no. So he says, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. <clears throat> when he said knew the grace, that's a phrase that speaks of coming to know perfectly. It speaks of maturing or growing in depth. When he says knew the grace of God in truth, well, he's commending Epaphras. He's saying that Epaphras was faithful in giving them the whole counsel of God. Epaphras did not shun from declaring them the entirety of God's word. You see, a man, 
A pastor who is going to be declared faithful by God is one who doesn't shun to declare unto his congregation the entire word of truth. You don't come to church to hear opinions by that man. You come to hear the word of God from that man. We would see Jesus, not your opinions. And so it's a man's, my responsibility and every pastor's responsibility to rightly divide the word in order that it's presented as it truly is. Not just my idea of why you should do this or don't do that, but because God's word declares we ought to do this and we ought not to do that for these reasons. And you get that from scripture. So they had held fast to that and they had learned that. And Epaphras was the person who gave them that. Now he ministered according to verses 7 and 8. He ministered, Epaphras ministered to Paul on behalf of the Colossian church because he was representing them. In verse 8, Epaphras spoke to Paul and he shared this report, told Paul that the church loved him. Well, as Paul is hearing this, notice what happens in verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, <laughs> do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy and giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So I prayed for you. What are you praying for? Well, he said, I heard it. It caused me to continue praying. And I've been asking God in my prayers that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom. I've been praying that you may walk worthy of the Lord. I pray that you will be fully pleasing to him. I pray that you might be fruitful in every good work. I pray that you would increase in the knowledge of God. I've been praying for you, Colossians, that you might be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for patience and long suffering with joy. I've been giving thanks to the Father who qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That's what I've been praying for. This is my model. This is what I've said. I want you to know the knowledge of his will. You see, knowledge of God's will is spiritually imparted as they seek the Lord in his word. In contrast to the false teachers who are trying to deceive them, Paul instructs them. And he makes it clear that it's the spirit who fills the believer with the knowledge of God's will. And you're going to see this later on in chapter 2 and other places. You'll be seeing this as he alludes to this kind of thing. But, but this knowledge of God's will isn't going to come through diets or religious rituals or the worship of angels. He's going to present that to us in a little while. Because at that time they're saying it. Listen, eat certain foods and do certain things. And No, he said it's not going to come that way. So meat doesn't commend us unto God. Neither if we eat are we the better. Neither if we eat not are we the worse. It isn't whether I eat pork or not. There are people who say, well, you can't eat pork. If you eat pork, you're far from God. Uh, no. I remember I was in the army, and I was, I was, I was going through a uh, chow line, and you're taking your life in your hands by doing that alone. <laughs> and we were going through chow line, and this guy was dropping food on plates, and I could see him saying something because the guys that he was serving we're kind of looking at him with a double take, everyone. And I was, you know, about 10 guys back. But I saw him like that. Were... So I thought, he's saying something. I wonder, I, I wonder what he's going to tell us. So I, I go up to him, and he drops a pork chop on my plate. And he says, this is what he said. I'm quoting him. It was, you eat that, you're going to hell. <laughs> now, if I eat it, I might feel like I'm in hell, but that's something different. If you eat that, you're going to hell. And I stopped. I stopped. I looked at him. Huh? I said, why? Because you can't eat pork. The Bible says so. I said, is that right? Now I'm a brand new Christian. I'm four months, five months old in the Lord. What do I know? So I said, no, nah, going to hell for a pork chop. I'm not quite sure. I've done worse things. <laughs> so I went, to the, I went and looked into the Bible. Meat does not commend us unto God. For neither if we eat are the better, neither if we eat, do not eat are we the worse. And I came back and I told him, no, that's not true. I don't go to hell because I ate a pork chop. We're not going to go to hell because we didn't eat certain things or did eat certain things. 
Because Jesus said that the real problem is, is not what goes into a man. Remember Mark chapter 7? It's that which comes out of him. Because that which comes out, that which proceeds adultery and murder and all of that, comes from man's nature. So the point that Jesus was making concerning diets, etc., is, listen, I came to fulfill the law, and I'm making all things clean unto you now. Because the real question has been answered because the food regulations sort of make you realize that there's a separation. But I've come in order that you might have relationship with God. And thus, I can eat carnitas anytime I want. <laughs> I do. And other things that people won't touch, I'll eat that too. Like menudo. But anyway... <laughs> So the point he's making is you're, you're not godly through ritual. You're not godly through a certain diet. Again, we'll see that. You're not godly through these things. You're, you're made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now he says in verse 10 that they may have a walk worthy of the Lord. Worthy of the Lord. You might have the right belief so that you might act properly. That word worthy is a, a Greek word that means uh, after a godly sort, that which is appropriate or suitable. So the desire is that we would walk, as John said in 3 John 4, that we would walk in truth. Now in verse 10 he says, fully pleasing him. Now how can we be fully pleasing? Well, he says by being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, by taking his word, applying it. And as they apply it, they increase in experiential knowledge. So when you hear his word and put it into practice, you actually are gaining experientially. There are things you've read but never done. When you do those things, now you gain insight. So that's how it works. If you keep my commands, Jesus said, then my Father and I will dwell with you and you'll gain a personal knowledge. That's how it works. He said, I had to pray in this way. I did. He said, I had to do this or not do that. I obeyed, and he showed up. He manifested himself to me. The Lord says to share your faith, and, and you say, I'm, um, I'm shy. I, I, I can't do that, you know. I'll pray that somebody else will come, and I'll pray for them when they do. But as for me, I'm shy. I don't know that much. And you argue with the Lord, and then somebody shows up, and you're talking, and the conversation naturally turns towards what have you been doing. You share some things. You tell them you became a Christian. They say, why? You begin to share. And before you know it, you're saying, wow, I'm, I didn't even know I knew that. And God shows up. And you go home with this holy glow saying, man, what a joy. God manifested himself. That's how it works. Trusting him, he shows up. And sometimes he may not seem to show up, but that's another kind of lesson he's going to teach you so that you walk by faith and not by sight. And it's just part of growing. But it starts with obedience, and we're walking to please him. In verse 11, he says, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. So this power enables them to live victoriously, even though they go through suffering, and even though they go through opposition. And then verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Giving thanks to the Father who qualified us. If God has given us His grace, then our response is thankfulness. And notice he has made us qualified. That word qualified means to be made suitable. He has made us qualified to be partakers through his relation, our relationship with his son. And verse 13, he delivered us from the power of darkness. That word delivered is a Greek word that means to be rescued. It speaks of being drawn. It literally speaks of dragging a person out of the jaws of danger. It's like you're on the ground and a lion is about to get you and someone drags you out just in time. And that's what he's done. He has delivered. He has rescued us. You see, he has given us power to overcome. He's given us power to not yield to the enemy any longer. We reject the enemy. We die to our carnal desire and we follow him. And when he rescued us, he translated us. He conveyed us. When he speaks concerning that, 
The word convey is to transfer. It, 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 it really applies to the transplanting of a people from one nation to another. It takes them from a settlement into a new home. He has translated us. He has taken us. He's conveyed us because we are now citizens of heaven. And our lives demonstrate that. We're different. We should be preaching the gospel with our lives. It's been said, preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. We are letters written that all men will read. They will watch my life and then listen to my words very often. On the job, you live for Christ. It's not that you're always pulling out a Bible and quoting it. God gives you opportunity. Of course, you take it. But it's that you live for Christ. It's that you live for Jesus. And people know that. And some of you know this firsthand by experience. Somebody may approach you and say, I've been watching you. When I was in the army, I still remember a guy walk up to me. And he said to me, I notice you pray before you eat every time. I've noticed, I didn't even know this guy. He's just at another table. He said, I notice that you, you pray every time. Are you in a religion or something? And I, and, I, and I shared with him, you know, I've been born again. I'm a Christian. And it gives you opportunity to share. So live for Christ. Live in such a way that people will look at you and will know there's something about you that really speaks like you're different. It's like what Titus 2.14 says, where it says Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Eager to do what is good. So we walk worthy of the gospel. We're eager to do good because we've been saved. And Paul is praying that we'd understand that. Live like a saved person. And then he says in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We're redeemed. We have eternal deliverance. We were in bondage but have been purchased. And the debt is completely paid off. It is finished. I don't owe anything. You know, you buy a car and you pay it off for six, seven years, whatever. And then you got in the habit of sending $350 a month. But one of these days, you know, you finally paid it in full they used to, they still do in some places, have one of these stamps, and they would stamp the contract, and it said, in red, interestingly enough, sometimes, paid in full. That's what happened when Jesus died on the cross for you. He said, it is finished. And it's like God's hand came down and stamped, paid in full. And when I said yes to you, Jesus, you said, your debt has been wiped clean. You owe me nothing. Just love me and follow me. That's Christianity. That's how we were saved. And so he said, we have redemption in Christ. And we have been set free. Jesus in John 8, 36 said it like that. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that's what we, the church, today need to remember. He set us free. Let's live as if we had been. Let us live worthy of the gospel. So when people see us, they'll say, something's different about you. I've seen a lot of these TV preachers and all they want is your money. But you don't ask me for anything. Can you tell me why? And then you can say, yeah, because Christ changed my life. And he caused me to love people. And I care about you. And I want you to know him too. And you can have ministry just by loving Jesus and walk worthy of the gospel.